Good evening, everyone. My name is Sally Freider, and I am the curator at the Ulrich Museum of Art. I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening and joining us for our visiting artist lecture with Radcliffe Ruddy Roy. Ruddy's talk is a part of our adjacent programming for visual justice, our main current exhibition at the Ulrich, which features the museum's most recent acquisition of photographic works by Gordon Parks. Although Parks was an author of prose and poetry, a filmmaker and musician, he was most widely known for his documentary photography. The public programs for visual justice aim to not only commemorate the work of Gordon Parks, but to explore the ways in which the various branches of his practice, those of photojournalism, documentary photography, social justice, and the use of art as a form of activism emerge in contemporary contexts. Visual justice is a gift purchase of the Gordon Parks Foundation. Courtesy and copyright of the Gordon Parks Foundation, purchase made possible by a challenge grant from Paula and Barry Downing, with major support from the WSU Student Government Association, Mike Indeed Michaelis, Emprise Bank, Jane and, and Jane and Ruben Sanders, Saunders, pardon me, artworks. Additional support from Don and Laura Berry, David and Carolyn Blackmore, Jane C. McHugh, Ed and Helen Healy, Fleeson, Gooing, Colson, and Kitch, Patty and Tony Vizzini, Bud and Tony Gates, and Bill and Alta DeVore. The exhibition and associated programs are made possible by generous contributions from the Samuel M. and Laura H. Brown Charitable Trust, administered by In Trust Wealth, Mickey Armstrong, Kansas Health Foundation, and the Fidelity Bank Foundation. Additional support provided by Marcia and Ted D. Ayers, Anne and Martin Bauer, Joan S. Barron, Eric Engstrom and Robert Bell, Gridley Family Foundation, Rex and Denise Irwin, Jane C. McHugh, and Keith and Georges Stevens. As with the documentary photographers that have preceded him, Ruddy Roy uses his camera as a tool that allows him to document the world around him as he sees it. The images that he produces speak to the human condition, addressing the myriad instances of suffering and injustice that he is witness to, which are often overlooked. Yet the images that he produces of events such as Hurricane Katrina, the Black Lives Movement, and chronic homelessness do not merely exist to capture mis misery. They also convey resilience and compassion. His portraits, which are frequently produced as collaborations with the people he photographs, are often produced in tandem with text that further humanizes them and evades their exploitation. And though he also showcases his work in traditional exhibition environments, through the act of posting his work to Instagram, he is able to engage with close to 250,000 followers, broaching the divide between viewer and subject, and collapsing the space between artist and audience, facilitating deeper engagement and understanding, while expanding the traditional framework of the documentary genre. Radcliffe Ruddy Roy was born in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and studied English literature at, is it Goucher or Gaucher? Goucher, my apologies, college in Towson, Maryland. Over his 15-year career, he has worked with publications such as the Jamaica Gleaner, Ebony, the New York Times, Essence, and for media outlets such as BET, ESPN, and the Associated Press. He has exhibited his work in various venues, including the Jamaica National Gallery, Photoville, Brooklyn, the Silver Eye Center for Photography, the Museum of Contemporary Photography, Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary African Diasporic Arts, and the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival in Toronto. An adjunct lecturer at Columbia University, the artist lives and works in Brooklyn. Please join me in welcoming Ruddy Roy. Good evening. I have never heard a better introduction, to be honest, seriously. And so you need to email that to me. <laughs> um, 
So now I'm like so off kilter. I was hoping that it would be just, Roddy, get up here, talk. And so then I would have to be the one to butter up everybody. Um, first, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I'm going to try and speak slowly so I can get everything I want to say. I want to thank the university for inviting me. I want to thank Jaina Durfee. Just make sure I get that right. Um, I want to st thank Stacy for the wonderful introduction. And before I go anywhere else, I want to invite everybody to sing happy birthday with me to Mark Durfee. So, <laughs> after three, no, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not gonna take up all this time, we're just gonna do it quickly. After three, let's start. Let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mark. Happy birthday to you. Um, and I did that because it means a lot to me that that little confusion happened. So thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing this to happen because I know all you had to say was no. Um, how do I get in here? Mm. If you allow me 30 seconds of silence for the dearly departed Tony Parks. Tony was the daughter of a Gordon, and she was a part of a collective that I was a part of. And um, so I'd like to give her 30 seconds before I begin. May her soul rest in peace. Um, I remember the first time I, I went back to the collective and I told Tony that there was this person that just told me that I reminded her of her father, Gordon. And I remember saying to her, I'm so unworthy. And I remember all she gave me was a smile and a sh crunch on my shoulder. And she goes, you need broad shoulders. On my way here today, not today, but on my way here to Wichita, I was walking up Utica Avenue, and there was a guy singing behind me. And he was singing the song, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Do people know that song? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And I instantly recognize it as a song from Jamaica, though I know Everybody in the world might have known that song. But the way he sang it brought me back to church when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When my mom, who was a deacon at the church, would look down at me from, and make sure that I wasn't doing this. <laughs> and I thought in that instant that that is what art is. Now, for me, that's personal. I mean, art to me is defined as something that transports you, whether forward or backward, whether back to your past, or it pushes you and it challenges you to go forward. And I remember saying to myself, you know, what am I going to show in Wichita? And it so happened that I started to think about Gordon. And I couldn't. Put it together, you know. I I come from a, I come from a place where you never ascribe to be your icon. You admire them from afar, and you go, you know, I could never do that. But I read something on the wall that was put up in his exhibition, and it said, "I had come to terms with Richard Wright's words. We are at the crossroads. Black people were on the move against racism." and I wanted to move with them. And I think about why I take images. Um, when I first moved to this country, I remember I was 20 years old. I was trying to figure out what and where I would end up. And I remember walking into a bookstore, walking to the literature section, and I picked up I Wonder As I Wander by Langston Hughes. 
my first novel in the United States. And after that, I read about five or six more Langston Hughes books. And it became a platform for understanding blackness in America. Um, I am also the kind of person, wherever I go, I, I kind of try to understand where I'm at. I don't necessarily bring Jamaica with me. Jamaica lives in my heart, but I, I try to understand the fabric that I'm a part of. And so I realized immediately that there was a struggle that was completely different from the completely black nation that I grew up in. There was a struggle with a group of people that felt disenfranchised, underprivileged, and in the face of poverty. And as we get into this, I remember sitting in my living room watching as the levees break by um, Spike Lee. And in it, Harry Belafonte said, the reason why the United States took so long to go to, the, this, to Katrina was because the people in the South were forgotten. And I said, you know what? I need to jump in my car and go photograph some forgotten people. And that was the birth of me realizing what my vision would be in this country. So I'm gonna share, and if I happen to come upon some, an interesting story, I'll pause and I'll talk about it, because we have 45 minutes and a lot of images. All right, so I actually drove from New York to Alabama in a nice little red Chevy, packed up with cameras, and, you know, after unloading my stuff at the, the hotel, I started to drive around where people, I mean, where the damage was. For me, I wasn't going there to photograph the hurricane or post-Katrina. I was there to document the people that were suffering because of how long it took them to get relief or um, people that were either rebuilding or going back to look at how devastated their homes were. Um, I remember driving over a couple of cars. And again, I'm just driving around Mobile, Alabama. And I met this 19-year-old, and he had this nice sawed off something in his hand. And I, I, it's so funny, I never felt fear. I mean, I just felt like, it was important for me to go and talk to him and ask him, why does he walk in around with a sawed-off shotgun? 19 years old. Um, this was actually my last day in Alabama. Um, I had decided to stop photographing. I had a friend with me, and he, I was trying to help him to get images. And I remember this guy walked up to me and he goes, can you take my photograph? And I was like, I'm done, you know. I'm... And he goes, please, I'm just leaving Angola. And I have a newborn. That's all I needed to hear, newborn Angola. Hey, time for a picture. And I remember going over to his house and Something about me and images. I mean, I tend to photograph images that resonate in me. And I remember when I walked into his living room, there was a sense of anger. His woman was not talking to him. And so being who I am, I just asked out of the blues, what's the name of your daughter? And let's say, for instance, his name was Anthony Brown. She introduced the daughter as Mary Pattison. And I go, hmm, doesn't have your last name. And so I started to dig deeper. I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, I'm not working. I mean, I have a record. So she doesn't see me as a part of the family. And as, I'm, as we're talking, he was so, like, he had just gotten out of prison, maybe in a month, and he was just so taken up with, with, his, with his daughter, and she was like, I really don't want him to be here. And I felt like this was something that pervaded the whole South. 
Um, at least 80% of the guys I spoke to in the South spent time in Angola. It was hard to find a black man in the South, in Mobile, that did not have a record. And so in my mind, I was like, so how are you guys getting work? How are you getting jobs? Um, and we can take that thought further. I was really fascinated by grills for some reason. Let's go back to this for a second. I started to read, and I keep forgetting the name of the book, ta Coates' new book, um, where he talks about his relationship with blackness and his son. And did somebody just say the name? The Boom. Boom. And um, thank you. And I was fascinated by the way he talked about the black body. Um, I have a, 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 a curator that I really admire. Her name is Professor Deb Willis. And she talks about the body a lot in the female context. But I've never heard anybody contextualize the male body. Um, I know as, a, as an artist, which I sometimes feel I am, I, I have thought about the way black men wear their saggy pants and the gold chain and the grill. And ta talks about it in the way that it is the way black men protect themselves. It is not as trivial as, oh, they don't know how to dress. It is a code that they follow that preserves their life their lives, and I immediately, as, as I was reading this book, I immediately looked back at these images as something different than just me saying, oh, that's his fashion statement. Um, I got the idea that if, if I walked around in Mobile, Alabama, in these clothes, I stick out. If I immediately transform myself, gold chain, oversized clothes, saggy pants, the likelihood that I'm protecting, I'm protecting myself just went up. And I get it. I'm fascinated by black men sitting around. Um, it has brought me to thinking about why black folks were brought here in the first place. We were brought here as labor force. And if you remove that labor force, if you, be, if you make that labor force obsolete, what becomes of the product? Of which we were. I mean, let's not kid around. We were a product. And so I enjoy sitting with black men and asking a simple question. How do you eat? How do you feed your family? How do you maintain pride in something as small as manhood. I grew up in a country where pride and manhood and shame were like clothes you put on. My mom would make sure, um, you sure you're wearing clean underwear? I'm like, mom, what does it matter if a car hit me? When they check your belly or any place, they wanted to make sure that you're wearing clean underwear. I'm like, mom, I might be dying. It's going to shame me. And I understood that. And I, I, I remember, I mean, I know that most, most kids in Jamaica lived their, life, their lives thinking about how their walk reflected back on their family. And so I would ask these men, how do you eat? How do you feed your family? Where do you get your pride from? I ate at the China Super Buffet every day. Every day. Didn't miss a meal. And, and for me, 
I mean, I, Mark asked me, I mean, well, he didn't ask me, he said he, something that he, he noticed. It's important for me to look into your eyes and have that conversation because I want the person to look back at whoever is looking at the image and for the, the collaborator to ask you, why do you allow this? Why do you allow a government to maintain poverty as a way of them making money? Why is it, why is it, why do we continue as a people to allow the minimum wage to be whatever that number is? Because it's up to us. It has always been up to us. We the people. I think those are the first, I don't, help me with my history here. You know, I'm Jamaican. On the first couple of, we the people. Hello? Can I get an amen? amen. All right. We're up here preaching too, you know. Hey, we're, uh, where's, my, where's my minister? Where two or three are gathered? Amen. So we're in church right now. Just so you know. It's important for me not to shield you from who these people are. Like, there's this, there's this thing in Jamaica called an ugly image. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that in, in, other, in other series. But I want you to notice her oversized jacket. Like, there's no, there's, there's, is, is it that she has no concern about fashion? Or is it that that's what she has, so she has to wear it? Like, those are, those are my questions when I go out. Mark, your image. I remember photographing Joseph Priest. Um, he was conceivably one of the, the dons from the, um, this area of R Roger Williams projects in Mobile, Alabama. And I was act I'm, I'm actually shooting Type 55 Polaroid film. At the time, they were $12 a, a sheet. And so, being on a budget, you're only gonna get two, if you get two. On the fourth sheet, I'm like, I think I got it, bro. Because he was giving me all these gang signs. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I have documented the dawn of Roger Williams. And he goes, one more. And I go, no. And then his boys kind of move. Let, them, let me see the nice little machines that they were having in their ways. And I was like, yeah, one more. Let's go. And so while I'm photographing, he does that. And I came from under the dark cloth, and I go, if you move, I'm going to kill you. And his boys go, what you say? I'm like, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But I saw this as the image. And I shot two more, like quickly, didn't even think. And I've never used, I've never even looked at the other five slides. Um, this became the the image of this, this, the southern journey. He also had a record. He also was shot up four times. But I enjoyed the symmetry that that line made. All the way down to his zipper. I usually just say, these are, these are, this, this, is, this has been my caption for the past 10 years. Um, He's 12 years old, she's 15 years old. Do the math. And funny enough, the father was standing off to the right, proudly. I'm sad that I didn't get to shoot a lot more of the, the juke joints when I was there. Um, sadly enough, they're, all, they're, they're, they're no longer in existence. It was hard to find a juke joint in the South. 
Um, I remember when I was photographing her, I asked her what her name was, and she said, Blaka. Um, that's B-L-A-C-K-A. -A. And all her neighbors were like, she's going to break your camera. She's so ugly. She's going to break your camera. And they were all saying this because of her, the, color, the color of her skin. And I turned around to her and I said, if you were in New York, you'd be on a runway. You're that beautiful. But she was also pregnant, so I don't know how that would work on the runway. Another interesting story. So I'm in, I'm in downtown Mobile, and I'm, I have my camera out on a tripod, and I'm photographing a portrait. This white guy walks up to me, and he goes, what are you doing? And I say, you know, I'm getting, you know, photographing portraits in the South. He goes, come with me, and I'll show you the right portrait. And I go, this brother think I just came off the boat. I'm going to come to the South and follow some white guy to I don't know where to show me the right photograph. And he goes, no, come with me. But being the Jamaican that I am, that have, that have a machete under the seat, I said, of course, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> so we ended up going to her house. And he says to me, she's my mom. And I go, obviously this brother think I'm off the boat because how does that work? And he goes, she was brought to my house at age 12 to be my mom's doll. And after she grew up, she was the one who took care of us. And it was just an amazing story to, see, to, to hear. And so when I brought her home, her kid said, she's not our mom. Our sister is our mom. Because she spent all her time at his house, raising him. Sports, one of the only ways kids in the South saw any ways of getting out of the, their plight, their situation. This is that same lady two year, a, a year later. I went back to Gretna to, I, th these are things I do. I mean, if there's, if there's something about a, a person that appeals to me, I always like to check in, I always like to go back. And if you remember, she was on the bed sideways. And I always wondered why she never moved. And the second time I went, I realized why she never moved. Um, but that's the, Baby, a year later. So I didn't even know that she also had been arrested. And a part of her plea was that she was on house arrest. I mean, I've printed this image 30 by 40, even bigger, and people miss the ankle bracelet. Yes, those effigies still exist, chilling in the south. The, 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 what what, what draw me to this picture is the fact that he, on his pants, and it's hard to tell in your picture, is there's an image of Malcolm X. I could do a whole series on black men just sitting. Oh, do it. <laughs> it's, a birth, it's a birthday party. Or a birthday.
I was actually packing up my equipment and he drove over and with the camera on my lap, I just went, toot. His name is Schomburg. And I remember the struggle I had to go through for him to pose until I said, do you know that there's a museum in New York with your name? And he goes, really? I said, yeah, there's the Schomburg. It, ho it hosts all the black images. He goes, word, ready. <laughs> um, shipbuilding was, the f one of, it was one of the biggest industries in the South. Because, of course, you know, we needed ships to go across, to, you know, that big continent? You know the big one, right? And bring, bring back people on this side. You know, that, you know that, that little thing there? And so this is one of the only jobs in Mobile. Mobile was one of the first ports that dropped off products, working products. And... Um, I remember sitting down talking to him about how he felt about working on these ships. And he was like, dude, it's a job. I have to feed my family. It doesn't matter how I feel about slavery or how I feel about what these ships did or haven't done or are going to do. This is how I feed my family. Ski. Yeah, I was fascinated with grills too. So I could do black men sitting with grills. <laughs> Interesting story. I could never find, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not um, assuming what women did in Mobile while I was there, but I could never find women after six. Like, I would wait around. Like, I would see Little images of women walking in the distance, but as soon as it becomes five and six o'clock, can't find them. And I never, you know, I never asked where they went. He had just come out of Angola. He said to me, I bet you I can make this cat sit perfectly for your image. This, actually, this is the first couple that ever said that I reminded them of Gordon. Actually, they didn't say Gordon. They said that photographer, that photographer. And I said, Gordon, I said, yes, Mr. Parks. Um, interesting story. She fed me every morning. I was at the Waffle House every morning, Mrs. Tucker. And... I remember when I was ready to leave, I went to her and I said, you know, I'm going to leave tomorrow. And she goes, could you come up to my house and take my picture? And I go, of course. And so the next morning we both drove up and she said, I'm going to get my husband. He's a little sick. I have to get him out of bed. And so I set up while she's getting him ready. And when I came out, again, you know, you know me being the, the accountant, I take out two sheets and I'm like, that's all I'm two sheets, 40 bucks, that's it. And I shot four sheets. And I looked at them and I go, I, I just did something like that. And he walks over to me and he's like, what's the problem? And I go, there's a line behind you. There was a closed line from that tree across. In a, in, I, should have, I should have prefaced it. One of the most pristine gardens I've ever seen in my life. And he goes, and he turns around, and he's a machete. And I go, this boy is Jamaican. One, one chop, and the line went down. And I shot this image. And he goes, could you shoot one more? And I go, <laughs> And I said, why? He goes, I'm going to pick a rose for my wife, because I don't know if there will be another Sunday that I get to give her a rose. And I was like, yeah, that's the image right there. So I shot this. 
And I started to pack my stuff up. And then he walked over to me and he goes, my wife and I decided to give you this rose because we don't know if we'll ever see you on, any, on another Sunday. And of course, my eyes started to like, <sighs> and I remember driving back to New York thinking about this couple. And I was bawling. Like, I bawled for at least all of South Carolina. I bawled, like, the whole time. Like, you know, South Carolina is the longest one. And I'm, like, bawling. Because for me, I was going back to a place that had no idea. Wasn't even thinking about the Tuckers. And two months later, Mr. Tucker died. And it was only then that I started to look at the image and look at his swollen hands to see that he was really ill, that he was actually dying. And for him, it was more important for me to get a good picture than to keep his pristine garden pristine. And that meant a lot to me. Um, so I'm, I'm, up from, I'm up from the South, and I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing with 400 sheets, I shot 400 sheets of black and white. Sheets. Somebody do the math, times $20. Um, and I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? And what happened to all that Vogue, that, that editorial, all that, what am I gonna do with all that work? And I remember just sitting down there, pondering what my, what my future was gonna be. And, you know, same time, you know, with all that's going on, I happen to have two boys. They just, you know, miraculously just appeared. And I started to think about the way people see them or the way, the way people are going to see them. And how do I fit in this equation? And I started to walk around. It wasn't even I started to walk around. I would always walk around bed where I live. And I would see these pockets of men who, again, sat on the side of the road, stood at the corner, baggy pants, overweight clothes. Uh, the new term is called trap. Maybe a couple of years ago it was called hustling. I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody can tell me what, what slinging was another word. But I'll, 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 I'll tell you where I'm going with this. I've been photographing a, a series in New Jersey over the past five weeks. And I have with me people from the neighborhood. Different, Ryan is one, different guys from the neighborhood. And he would say, like I went to Camden. Anybody know Camden, New Jersey? Um, I was told, I have no way to corroborate what they're saying. I was told that every black male who doesn't have a job, who doesn't have a nine to five, is hustling. Everyone. And some places that I, I mean, I remember photographing this, this barber. And as soon as he finished cutting the guy, the guy came up to me and he goes, would you like some heroin? Would you like some molly? I got weed over here. And he was just like, and I'm like, dude, you don't even know if I'm a cop. He goes, it doesn't matter. I'll be in and out and back on the street. And for me, understanding that that's a reality for some people shames. I mean, I feel, I feel a sense of shame that I'm not doing enough to change or to help change the reality of a road that my sons are going to walk on. And that's how I was thinking. Um, and so I started to sometimes take them, sometimes alone, walk around bed and photograph black men. Sit down, talk to them. Try to understand why, how do you, where do you get? Why do you think hustling is the answer? What if you go to prison? Don't you, don't, all these questions will come up. Um, I met the mayor, he's called the mayor of bed um, And all he kept saying to me was, it never used to be like this. But since they came in, I'm like, they who? You know, the other people? 
since they came in, we have no jobs. So I go, you know, where's your council? Well, talk to your council people. I mean, he goes, they don't listen to us. And so I started to understand that there was, there's a group of people living close to me, because this is walking distance, that felt disenfranchised, that felt that they had no voice. And I go, how, what can I do? And so I started to walk out and photograph these men. And I think that's where my pictures that initially started, if you go all the way back into my Instagram feed, the captions were one line. And I started to write. I started to talk about my communication with these men. Alfonso used to sit at the corner of Marcus Garvey and Jefferson. And he used to talk about his hips, that he, he had to go all the way to New Jersey, far from where he was, just to get medicine for his hips. The sad thing is, may, may, I shot this maybe a year or two ago, I don't see Alfonso anymore. He's not there anymore. And, and these, for me, these happen all the time. Like, a year, I'll, I'll be driving, I'll drive by a certain street, I'll get to know somebody, and by the end of that year, nothing, they're gone. This was Easter Sunday. And if anybody know anything about Jamaica, Jamaica has a church on every corner. Highly spiritual people will chop you up in a second. Highly spiritual people. And I remember, I remember Easter Sunday. I mean, I, I, I don't get the chance to go to church often here. Can't handle the mega churches. But I, I still practice in my own way. And I remember going out on Easter Sunday. I had to, take, I had to make a picture on Easter Sunday. And I heard some cat calls behind me. Hey, ma, sexy ma. And I was like, you know, today's Easter Sunday. I can't look. I can't be a part of that. Whatever, I have to keep my gaze front and center. And I remember her passing me on my right. And I did the only godly thing I could do was to turn away. Because it's Easter Sunday. I'm not, if it was Monday, I would be looking. But it's Easter Sunday. I can't be a part of this sin. And... I remember when I swiveled, turned around, she was going across, be, making a beeline for this church. And I go, that's a picture. Maybe I can get this sexy girl in front of the cross, have this contrast thing going on. And that's all, that's all in my mind. And I walk all the way over to her. And as she's standing there, I raise my camera. And she starts to cry. And I go, okay, what did I do? And she goes, nothing. You are just validating a decision that I made yesterday. And I go, which decision was that? She goes, I decided to give my life to the Lord today on Easter Sunday. And I go, so what was that life? She goes, I was a prostitute yesterday. And I was just like, both of us standing up in the middle of the street going, <laughs> and... For me, again, is do these, do these images translate to a, a, a bigger story? So this, this image was a part of a portfolio that I showed to an editor at Harper's Bazaar, Harper's, Harper Magazine. And she goes, Mary Magdalene. And I go, oh, you know. She goes, it's there. It's there in the image. And then I told her the story. I followed a, a, a family for a week in the winter, a family that lived on the streets of New York. They actually, they were, they were living in the Bronx. Um, the boy is actually not his son, but he was in love with the, the, the mom. And so they were on the street panhandling for, when I met them, maybe three months, but I could only do a week. I mean, I literally could not, spend more than maybe seven hours with them. I was dying. And I think that I'm a very, you know, strapping young brother. 
with strength. I couldn't handle this. And so while I was photographing them, and this was, this was one time where they went to a, a, a housing complex to shelter when it got really cold. Um, but I would go out with them daily to photograph them panhandling. And I remember waking up one morning while I was making breakfast for my sons, and I go, I've never seen them make breakfast for these, this boy. Stop. As I was pouring my milk, I've never seen this kid drink milk. So I went out the next day and I started to photograph the kid. Like I was like, what is he eating? And it was then that I realized that they were feeding him Arizona iced tea and Kit Kat. That was his food. And I was like, why would they do that? And I realized that when you beg, you beg a dollar. Arizona costs 99 cents. Kit Kat costs a dollar. So they were actually budgeting the food within the parameters of what they were begging. And I was like, they're kind of smart. They're kind of, this is what they do. But I could, only, I, I could only last a week. Thankfully, she got wise, kicked him out, and went back home to her mom with her son. This is another Easter Sunday picture. I'm always fascinated by why black men wear the flag. It's a question I ask them all the time. You know, knowing the trials and tribulations that you, your ancestors have gone through, why you love the flag? Interesting answers. It's all on my Instagram. Quick story. This guy was a tyrant, tyrant on my block. And I eventually moved away from that block. And one day I saw him and he had lost an eye. And I, I have to, I mean, this, this might not be a very Christian thing to say or a very human thing to say, but I was like, somebody did it for me. Because I wanted to slap, I wanted to hit him. And so I was like, what happened? He was like, I was in this argument with somebody and all of a sudden he turned on the bat and he hit me. And I said my, under my breath, Good. He was so bad. But trust me, he was quiet after this. Like we had a wonderful conversation. He had, I mean, I go back and I see him now, not a peep, no argument. His voice doesn't raise above zero dec decimal anymore. I go, good. Sometimes it's good to lose an eye. I think about aging a lot. And this, I made this picture. Um, because I was fascinated, I'm fascinated with, as we age, how we keep up with technology. I just found out that this young lady is dying. I just like a couple a month ago. Um, when I photographed this, she, um, they, her landlord, landlord had cut off her electricity. Um, but again, I, I chase stories where people feel like there's nobody else to talk to. So I went, I went from my community of bed and I started to, I, you know, like everybody else, we're in front of the TV and we see um, Black Lives Matter and we see young black men dying all over. And again, you know, how do you, as a dad, how do you go, you know, uh, okay, so, and I've said this, and it might be the ugliest thing I'm going to say on record. Um, how do you, how does, a, how does the law come back to me and say, you know, your son was just walking across the street, minding his own business. He happened to have a knife in his hand, but he was walking away from you, and we shot him. And I say, and I've said it to all my friends, end of Ruddy Roy's life. I would commit the rest of my life to some justice. 
And so I decided that that path wasn't positive. Why don't I photograph this movement and see where it goes? So I have been actually, this was in um, Ferguson. Um, these are pro supporters of um, Mr. Wilson who shot Mike Brown. This was, remember I talked about the word ugly and I said I would go back to, to that word? In my mind, I consider this an ugly image. And you know, you're told in the industry, you're told among your peers that you should always put the best of black people forward. In a way, censor it because you want the images of, I mean, too long the iconography of black images have always been brutes, um, over-sexualized females, um, thugs. And I remember driving around and I saw her and I'm, and I'm like, why is she in this state? And I photographed, I actually walked up to her and asked her if I could photograph her. And we sat down and we talked. Um, because I wanted people to understand that their votes matter. That you can change the way somebody who lives 3,000 miles away from you, your vote can change and affect the way they live. And so that's why she's there. She's there to say, I need, I need to remind myself every day that I, I am out there, I'm going out there to make, to, not to be a champion, I hate that word because I'm, I'm no champion, but that my voice is important within the conversation of who do we vote for, how do we make change? One of the students asked me today, how do we change? How do we actually make change as a student? And I said, you know, how many students are in this class? And she said, 12. I said, that's 12 bucks. I said, you each have, hopefully, have a parent. That's 24 bucks plus your 12. So we're, we're, we're at $36 already. And I'm sure your parents know people. And even if we're not talking about money, you have some old clothes at home. Donate them. I think that as a, we the people have not been people. We have been we the self. And so she's, this is why she's here. She's here not to, not to put her out on Main Street, but to say, I, Roddy Roy, should be ashamed that I'm not doing enough to make sure that I help somebody when I'm back in New York, that I'm a, I can continue to work for that voice in Alabama. I was telling somebody here in Wichita that I live a very fear, in a very fearless way. Um, the worst that can happen to me is I die. I'm not, I'm not going to be on the other side going, God, I wish I was on that. Dead. So, I go, you know, I, I see the gun and I immediately tense up, but I know why I'm there. <clears throat> and this is the other easy answer. The easy answer is I've lived my life by faith, all my life. I might not go to church every Sunday, but I know that if, there, if we believe in a creator, the creator can come down and vouch for the fact that I live by faith. I don't go, I don't go to Mobile thinking, I'm going to go get light. I'm going to go get... Roddy Roy is going to be a better photographer. I know that every time I, I tell these stories that I'm in there for the right reasons. I'm in there because I believe in a future where my two sons can live differently. And so my questions come across as, this dude is genuine. Um, of the 4,000 images I have on Instagram, I've had 10 no's. Maybe it's technique. Maybe it's the fact that I believe that there's, there's, the blood is on me, for lack of a better way of saying that. I engage because I don't know another way. And if I was back in Jamaica, community is how I grew up. I grew up knowing everybody on my block. And that's the one thing I miss here. So part of me is living through those, those changes and doing it the best way I can, which is to touch people. So I, I, I go there fearlessly because I, I believe in what I'm doing and I try to get that up across to you. Like, for me, it's not about I am trying to build the Roddy Roy brand. I don't care about the Roddy Roy brand. I care about the Mosiah and Ayoshawa brand. I care about how they grew up as young men in a society that, to me, is vicious, selfish, heartless. And I hope that I'm an example for them. Simple as that.